Hello, I am Suzanne Weeks, and I'm the Executive Director of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Welcome to the SIAM Invited Address. SIAM is an international association and a welcoming community that fosters the development of applied mathematics, computational science, data science, and modeling, all these things that are so essential to many application areas. Through publications, research, and community, SIAM's mission is to build cooperation between mathematics, society, and the worlds of science and technology. First, I would like to thank the selection committee for the SIAM invited address. Those are Professors Ricardo Cortez, Maria Emelianenko, and Magozota Pajinska. The committee considered SIAM members with major contributions in applied or industrial mathematics, regardless of their research area or institution, whether they were in industry or academia. In particular, they looked for someone with a high level of accomplishment, who is also an excellent speaker and whose work connects multiple areas of applied mathematics and statistics, and who is a great SIAM ambassador. Thalia Zarifopoulou, our speaker today, meets all these measures. Dr. Zarifopoulou is a holder of the Presidential Chair of Mathematics and the VF Neuhaus Professorship of Finance at the University of Texas at Austin. Previously, she was the long professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she's the first holder of the statutory Oxford Mann Chair in Quantitative Finance at the Mathematical Institute at the University of Oxford. Her area of expertise is financial mathematics, quantitative finance, and stochastic optimization. She has published extensively in the areas of investments and valuation and introduced novel approaches to indifference valuations, risk measures, and dynamic utilities. She has served very actively the community of financial mathematics. She sits on the editorial board of 11 academic journals and research monograph series and she's the editor of the SIAM series in financial mathematics. She has served on various prize committees and panels, and she's been the vice chair of the SIAM activity group in financial mathematics and engineering. And she has served as vice president and president of the Bachelier Finance Society. In 2012, she received the honor of becoming SIAM fellow and in 2014, she was an invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematics in Seoul. Thank you, Dr. Zarifobulu. We are looking forward to your talk. Welcome. Thank you very, very much, Susan. And I also thank the Society and SIAM for giving me this opportunity. Um, let me switch to my slides and... <clears throat> Is everything uh, showing okay? Yep. All right. So first of all, um, happy new year and a safe year to all of you. And today I'm going to present some um, brand new results on a brand new area of research in financial mathematics, which is related to what we call um, human machine interaction systems in robo advising. I'm not sure how familiar you are with um, financial mathematics. In general, I could say that there are two main directions in our field. One has to do with um, evaluation. And in order to do that, you need to broadly speak, like very informally speaking, you need, you need to eliminate the risk. And this takes you to linear valuation mechanisms, expectations, Martingales, and linear PD. The other side of the coin is investments. And there, of course, you do not want to eliminate the risk. You want to exploit it. And naturally, you, put, uh, you have to specify and build models for how you feel towards these risks. And naturally, this leads to nonlinear criteria and stochastic optimization problems. Now, of course, the investment practice is very big and we start with a big scale investment universes, and then we go down to the personal investment plans. 
So what has been happening in, um, in the industry right now is um, the very fast development of what we call robo-advisors. And these robo-advisors are automated investment platforms. They have um, very little, if any, interaction with human um, advisors. They started in 2008 during the, um, after the financial crisis. They have um, many advantages that has to do with taxes, with automation. They are extremely appealing in particular to the younger investors. And we expect the robo advisors market to skyrocket. On the other hand, as I will be discussing with you today, there is very little, if anything, in this area, and there are many reasons for this. So when we start talking about a human machine system, essentially, we will be talking about two parties. We will be talking about the client, you and me, and we will be talking about the machine. So when you look at the client, the client is a 3D human, yes, and the client has emotions. Emotions can be risk aversion, bounded rationality, rational attention, and a long list of things we carry inside us. And also the client has financial goals. On the other hand, the robot advisor does not have any feelings, but has computational power and incredible access to market opportunities. So when we start thinking about building a human machine system, essentially we will be confronted with problems like how do we build their interaction? How do we build their communication? Um, should the machine always satisfy the client's wishes? Uh, how should the machine um, face the market uncertainty. So as you are going to see, there's going to be a long list of problems, a long list of modeling questions. And what is fascinating about this uh, very brand new area is that it will involve a long list of mathematical areas. So we're going to see that we will need expertise from stochastic optimization because we will be talking about portfolio selection we will be looking at what is known as time inconsistent optimization. It's a very active area in stochastic control. We will be looking at stochastic differential games because at the end of the day, we have a pair, the client and the machine trying to cooperate. We will be looking at how frequently they should be communicating. So we will naturally have optimal stopping problems. We will be having nonlinear filtering problems because the machine cannot know the, the client at all times. And then we will also have some ill pose problems and so on. And as I said uh, earlier, there is very little in this area. There is some qualitative research where there is institutional discussion, there is some empirical discussion, and these are the only papers basically. And there is also some quantitative research, and I will be talking today um, primarily about the way we thought with Agostino Caponi and Svein Olefsson on the first qualitative quantitative paper in robo-advising. And then there are three other papers where the, the, the focus is not so much how to build a system, but more to understand what we could be doing in order to model the investor preferences. So today I will be talking to you about this robo-advising interaction systems. So let's try to see how we can start even thinking about this kind of systems. So first of all, the investor, the client will have a horizon, we'll have an investment horizon, which I will take to be finite, let's say capital T. And then forward in time, there is going to be a communication schedule. 
and the communication schedule will be modeled with some times, random times that will be coming along. At these random times, the client will communicate the preferences he has, the investment goals she has, life changes, and so on. The robo-advisor will have to quantify, build a model for what we will be calling a utility. It's a risk preference structure for the client. At the same time, the robo-advisor will be reassessing the market conditions at this communication time. So there will be two things, preferences, updated preferences, and communication and market conditions. And then the robo-advisor will be solving an optimal allocation problem, and I will be denoting this problem by, um, by calligraphic fee. But this problem at tau n will be defined all the way up to capital T. But on the other hand, as soon as the new communication time arrives, a new problem of this, a similar nature will be triggered. So um, the, when we talk about the, this uh, problem, essentially, we will be talking about the, um, a couple of preferences and models. And this um, problem will be initiated at tau n. And what is important is to understand that at tau n, the utility of the investor will be specified, but the utility is a target that will be imposed at capital T. And this is quite important because we will be confronted with measurability problems of the targets, model selection, and communication times as we move along. So before I describe the problem, um, the problem, the, the script phi, I would like to share with you some background knowledge. And this is related to the core optimal investment problem that we will be having at every communication time towards the end. So um, when we talk about, at least in the academic universe, a portfolio selection continuous time model, we will be talking about a market, and a market is always related to an uncertain environment, a probability space. The market has assets whose prices are modeled through certain processes, typically, most generally, ETO diffusion processes. The, the fund manager, robot advisor, you name it, will be looking at investment strategies. The investment strategies will be adapted to the information available. And then we will be looking at what we call a value function, which is the maximal expected utility we can have of the terminal utility. So what we have here is a target, which is our utility function, and this is our terminal wealth. So this is a classical problem in financial economics, and understanding this problem is a core research area in, in our field. So when we look at this problem, it's important to realize that even though it appears to be a dynamic problem in the sense that I will be looking at times and decisions and so on and so on, from the point of view of modeling, it's a static problem. Why? Because I will choose the horizon once, I will choose the market model once, I will choose my preferences once, and then I will choose my objective once. Of course, when you try to build a robo-advising system, this template that I have here will be moving in time and also will be moving stochastically in time, triggered any time there is a communication time. All right, so... Um, just to put some uh, mathematics on, on, on the board, I wish I had the board actually, um, we're looking at a market that is 
uh, that involves two securities um, given by these two equations. There's a Brownian motion in the probability space that uh, models the uncertainty. There is what we call a control process that is given by this diffusion. And then there is, as I said, the objective that is our value function. And the objective can be either analyzed when we have Markovian models. What is a Markovian model? It is a model of stock and bond that depends locally on state and time. Then everything can become, can be locally analyzed through the Bellman equation. On the other hand, for more general problems, um, the, the Bellman equation is not um, available and we need to go through duality methods. As I said earlier, the analysis of this problem is a core area in, in our field. So having this in mind, I would like to stress the fundamental element in the analysis of this problem. And I'm sure that many of you who work in stochastic optimization know it, is what we call the dynamic programming principle. The dynamic programming principle is nothing else than a semi-group property of the value function. It basically tells you that you can solve the problem backwards in time. And that's why it's called backwards. Sometimes it's called the backwards um, um, Martingale principle and so on. And it is um, fundamental for the analysis of this problem, independently on whether we look at Markovian models or Ito diffusion models and so on. It is a core element in the stochastic optimization, optimal investment problems we, um, we study. And when this dynamic programming principle fails, then we have many interesting problems to worry about. So let's go back now to the robo-advisor's stochastic optimization problem, which is nothing else than the problem I just described, but in, in communication, generated at communication times till the end. So now, what is that is interesting? Well, these um, expected utility problems that I presented to you in the, in the template under the umbrella of the Merton problem are not that realistic. So when we want to start thinking about models of robot advising that can be, can be appealing to clients and can have some kind of connection with you know, real life, these academic utilities we have been analyzing and teaching and writing about are not that relevant. So we need to understand how to talk about, how to think about uh, more complex risk preference processes. So this is number, uh, problem number one. The second problem is that anytime there is a communication with the client and the, and the machine, then there is a reassessment not only of the financial goals, but also on the new market um, opportunities. So we are facing the problem. We learn, we have more information about the market. How do we use it? Now, why is this a problem? Because as I mentioned earlier, when we solve stochastic optimization problems, the dynamic programming principle gives us the solution backwards in time. So the theory of solving these problems goes backwards in time, but real-time information goes forward in time. So there is this clash of the theoretical framework and the, inf the dynamic information acquisition. Of course, this is not the first time we talk about this kind of problems. And there is this very interesting area of adaptive control, but we have partial answers there, as I will discuss. We have robust control, which is, of course, very applicable, but gives very, very conservative controls. We have filtering, but even filtering is based on a one-time single choice of the filter. So there are some nice, interesting problems there. And then we have um, the serious problem of communication, because we will be, we need to build a communication schedule between the client and the machine. And we have non-trivial measurability issues because as the recent reality has taught us, 
there are various unpredictable events that will change our lives, will change the way we feel, will change our financial goals. And it is just impossible to model them a priori when we build the com a communication schedule. So this is what I would like to discuss with you. And I would also apologize for not putting any references. It's just impossible because I will be touching on many different areas of applications. So first of all, we need to come up with more complex pref risk preference models. And such models exist, of course, but the, their analysis is not that easy. So we need to talk about, um, about utility processes that capture better the way we feel. And I would like to um, focus on four such kind of, of um, utility processes. One family is what is known as hyperbolic discounting uh, utility processes. And these are utility processes that have a discounting that is different across times. And there is an intermediate time. Um, there is a typo here. So we have a utility that starts from tau n and goes up to capital T, but in between at capital T1, the utility changes in, in discounting. And this creates uh, various interesting mathematical questions. Why? Because the dynamic programming principle fails and therefore the theory as we know it needs to be rethought. These problems arise very often when we talk about life-changing events. You have, you, you have a family or your uh, personal conditions change, or when you go from one generation to the next, and their analysis is quite interesting. Then we have the other models that are models well-known to economists, of course, uh, models of bounded rationality. And these are models where we also discount at the end of the horizon. And examples, young people think about their wealth, assuming that they're going to be healthy uh, five, 10 years from now. Um, these are extremely interesting problems. Very little has been done in dynamic settings. We also have problems that are related to behavioral finance, and these are problems with what we call probability distortions. Whether probability distortions are, are related to how we distort bad events. So behavioral finance has um, observed and believes that we don't assign the same probability on all events. We are more fearful disproportionately on bad events. And this gives rise to what is known a rank dependent utility. And these utilities are formalized by this uh, nonlinear, um, uh, this, uh, this integral that I have, that I highlight here. What is interesting about these problems? Again, the dynamic programming principle fails. Um, these uh, optimization problems give rise to uh, optimization criteria with what we call nonlinear expectations. There's a very nice theory about this. What is difficult with these problems is that we don't have a suitable uh, nonlinear stochastic calculus um, platform to analyze these problems. And still, many questions are open um, for, for research. In general, I would say that when we want to build utility problems that are more realistic and more complex, we will be looking at problems that have what we call time inconsistency at large. And these are problems where we have a combination of the classical criterion of stochastic optimization. So you try to maximize the expectation of your utility, but also you have another term that is a utility of an expectation. And these problems give rise to um, time inconsistent problems, dynamic programming principle fails. The notion of optimality is not uh, universal. And um, we need to uh, come up with 
different frameworks to analyze these problems. The most popular is a game formulation. This gives rise to some uh, interlinked uh, Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equations. And surprisingly, even the most fundamental problem in practice, not in theory, because so far I have been talking to you about academic work primarily. In practice, the most popular way of building investments is based on what is known as the mean variance optimization problem that was introduced by Markovich. And I would like to spend just a couple minutes to talk about this problem and also highlight what we mean when we talk about time inconsistency. So um, this problem, and I will present it for historical, out of historical respect, um, was introduced by Markovich. And this problem is a problem of a single period. And we have securities that are available for trading. We allocate uh, weights on these securities. We have a return. That's fine. And then we have a criterion. And there are two equivalent ways of thinking about mean variance. The first formulation is we fix an acceptable variance at capital T, and then we try to maximize the expectation of our return. Equivalently, we fix the mean, and then we minimize the variance. And these two problems are equivalent, of course. Now, as I said, this is the most popular problem, uh, the most popular way in the industry of building allocations. And it has many problems, but this is the predominant way of uh, constructing portfolios. So let me now um, um, discuss with you what it means to have an inconsistency in your problem. The, why? Because time inconsistency, as I said, is a central element in realistic utility processes. So when I talk about time inconsistent problems, I start with a variance target uh, that I set at zero. And the variance target is for the end of the horizon to capital T. Now, when I solve this problem, I will be creating, I will be constructing the optimal policies. This is the optimal policy for period one, and this is the optimal policy for period two. That's fine. Now, when I go to the uh, time capital T, I will be, which is the intermediate time, then I will be updating my variance target. So if I choose the same target that I had before, which was from zero to two capital T, then I'm going to see that there is inconsistency in the following sense. So here I will be creating a new policy. And then when I will be comparing the two, I will see that these two policies do not coincide. So what you see here is a fundamental difficulty in understanding, in, in constructing policies across periods. Is time inconsistency a big deal? Yes, it is. It is a big deal. And for various reasons that I will explain later on. It is also a big deal because it, it gives um, a very interesting mathematical, you know, there are many nice mathematical questions when you don't, you don't have time consistency in your, uh, in your setup. Okay? All right. So, um, I will be now moving to the second problem that we have when we built models of um, human machine interaction, which is related to the model risk. So, so far I talked to you about various issues we are facing that has to do with the preferences structure of the investor at the communication time talent. 
Now I will move to the next difficulty, the next, uh, the next element, not difficulty, that is related to the model risk. Now, why do we care about this? Because um, I will be facing the following issue. When the client communicates with the machine, communicates the utility process, capital U, then the machine will have to solve this optimization problem. In order to solve this optimization problem, you need to specify the machine, I mean, the machine needs to specify the entire model from little tau n to capital T. Otherwise, we cannot solve this problem through the dynamic programming principle, backwards construction, and so on. Therefore, I will be looking at a control process with the dynamics of the control process updated in real times. I should say at this point that the machine does not have to update the market dynamics at communication times. And this creates a very interesting set of, a set of very interesting questions on when does the machine evaluate the new market conditions faster, slower than the times that communicates with the client. And there are very nice homogenization problems here due to the different scales. So what happens now? At tau n, the implicitly, the machine creates expectations from the client at, to the client about future performance. So if you look at V, V is nothing else than the value function that the client expects for all the way up to capital T. However, it's important to realize that this element is nothing else than the value function at information tau n. And let me go back here, just see here what I mean. So this is a conditional expectation at the information we have at time tau n. So you can think of V tau n to capital T as what we call a reservation utility that the client creates expectations, aspirations um, for future performance from tau n to capital T. Clearly what this performance is going to be depends heavily on the market model, right? But the market model is something the client knows only at tau n, all right? So the client and the robot advisor communicate. There is a certain knowledge about the market. Look at the market at uh, uh, January, 2021, right? Tau n is January, 2021. Two months later, the, the, the pandemic caused a shock in the market and therefore the initial model that was chosen at tau n has to be readjusted. By readjusting the model, the client is not aware of this of course, but the robot advisor will be aware because the robot advisor has the opportunity that it's power after all to truly go and look at the market and update the market conditions. Therefore, we always have always have model decay. But this says that after all, the robot advisor might not be able to deliver this promised V. In some rare cases, it might deliver better, but in many cases, it might go below V. So what should the robot advisor do in order to mitigate this model risk? Do we have this model risk? Of course, because new information about the market, all with markets always arrives. And the question is, how does the robo advisor balances the promise that implicitly gives through this reservation utility to the client and the risk that the robo advisor has by the updated market conditions? 
So this creates actually an extremely intriguing in-force problem. So what happens is that at tau n, this is what the client expects. But the model as such will be changing at times beyond the initial one. So think of the model as a process on its own that is being adapted as the robo-advisor learns about the markets. The robo-advisor has promised to the client this V, but the forward reality modeling wise will be changing. So how can the robo-advisor guarantee that no matter what changes we have, this V will be delivered? Well, the only, the only freedom that robo-advisor has is to change its own utility. And if there is no change in the model, this utility is also the utility of the client. That's fine. But when the market changes, the only way the robo-advisor can truly preserve the V, the reservation utility, is by changing the utility that the machine has. And this is a main difference between the adaptive control and what we are proposing here. Adaptive control adapts the market model, but always keeps the final utility the same. Here we go the opposite. We start with the reservation utility that is being implicitly created at communication times. And then we look at this, that is the initial utility, if you like, the updated market uh, universe that the robot advisor has the ability to, uh, has access to. And then we need to put a new utility that is now the, uh, the robo advisor's utility. That's the utility of the machine in order to keep the promise that gives to the client at our end. So this creates actually an extremely interesting inverse problem. And what we are facing here is we have an initial uh, point, an initial condition, if you like, and then we try to find a utility that matches it. And this is related to what um, we created with Marek Michel about 10 years ago, and we keep uh, building this theory on forward utilities. This is the opposite of the classical uh, utility structure where you put a terminal utility and you go backwards. Here you put an initial utility and you go forward. And the initial utility can be thought as what does the client expect the machine to do for, for him or her for the, for the remaining horizon of the, of the investment. Now, it turns out that if you look at, um, maybe I should not um, bother you with that. Uh, it turns out that you can characterize the, this process that you are looking for, this forward utility through uh, an infinite dimensional ill-posed problem. Why ill-posed? Because it's an inverse problem. We start with an initial condition. What is the initial condition? The V at tau n. And then we try to find a utility from the machine point of view that um, can match the V as the market moves. Where do I see as the market moves? I see it here because you can see the coefficients of the market, the mu and the sigma, adapt as time goes, and the SPD that I have here also adapts with time. So in order for the robo-advisor to mitigate what we call market model risk, we believe a good model, a good approach is for the machine to start building its own utility. This utility is characterized in ETO diffusion markets by this kind of infinite dimensional ill posed SPD. Um, what you see here is the updated in real time market coefficients 
And then what you see here is an extremely intriguing uh, modeling input that is not present in classical optimization because there it is uniquely specified, but in forward optimization, the diffusion term of the utility of the machine is a modeling input. Now, um, it is related to how confident the machine is about the market assessment. It might be related to various other things that are related uh, that are connected to how the machine guides the client and so on. But at the end of the day, what we have here in order to mitigate model risk is a fascinating um, ill-posed infinite dimensional problem. So now I will go to the final part of the, of, of the, the problem that we keep um, analyzing. I already talked to you about utilities. I already talked to you about the model risk. And now I need to conclude with the communication schedule. And this is actually, um, uh, we know very little about how to, to talk about it. And in the paper with Agostino and Sven, we propose um, um, one way to, to build a communication schedule, but there are very nice questions that determine the communication schedule. Above all, we need to understand uh, or we need to build good models about the measurability. So what is the risk here? The risk is that the machine might ask the client too early or too late. That's one risk. The other risk is that the clients might not be willing or might not be even able to communicate um, what they want. And some other times clients uh, have uh, irrational behavior after certain events, you know, you lose a lot and then all of a sudden you become extremely risk averse. The machine should not uh, cater to this, uh, to this behavior of, of, of yours. So these questions actually are not easy to, to address. So, so far we have been thinking about one direction that is related to building uh, regret bounds and regret bounds are roughly speaking, um, confidence intervals related to the value function without communication and the value function with communication. And then you can present these bounds to the client from the beginning and say, well, choose. If you don't want me to bug you every week or every month or when this happens and this happens, you might be missing in, in, um, in performance that much. So this is one way to think about building a communication schedule and we have a very detailed analysis in the paper with Agostino as well. The other direction could be related to optimal stopping problems because you can say to the client, I'm the machine and I communicate to the client and say, look, I mean, I can, I can solve this problem or I can guarantee that you are given this uh, upper bound on or this lower bound on performance and then you choose. So this creates a family of optimal stopping problems that are uh, triggered at communication times. And um, again, the analysis of such problems has not been um, done before. So I think that I should stop here. And um, I guess everybody's getting hungry even though we are spread in different time zones. So what I would like you to remember from my talk is first of all, my wish for a, for a healthy year. And then robot advising is um, a fast developing area of applications. We have very little um, quantitative uh, things to show. And there is, um, a, there's a long list of extremely interesting questions across various areas of um, theoretical and applied mathematics. So thank you so much for your patience and uh, sit. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm gonna have you hear my applause at least. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, um, let's see what the time is. We may have time for maybe one question I see. Um, someone has asked um, about addressing barbell strategies. Um, is that, do I have that correct? What is that? Um, 
I see a comment here that says address barbell strategy, separate safe and risky asset pools. I'm not sure. I'm, this is not my area, so I'm not sure if this is a Oh, thing. I don't think I can answer this question that easily because this is a kind of strategies that, uh, that the machine might choose. And mm -hmm. uh, that's fine. We can look at performance of these strategies, but what does it say about the, 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 the preferences? Like who would like these strategies to begin with? Mm -hmm. And I don't know who has asked this question, but even if we try to map um, very popular strategies like risk parity strategies and ask the question, what utilities generate such kind of strategies, that's an open question. So I'll be very happy to follow up on this, but I don't think I can give a quick answer. Right. Okay. So um, any other questions from the audience? We have a nice crowd here. And I, I know I've already seen some names that I recognize. I won't call on people like class, like in class, because I know we're almost out of time. But if you have any other questions, let me know. So I really um, like the way you know you started off by saying that this brings together so many mathematical areas. So there's so many mathematical things that are involved. You talked about filtering, ill post problems, um, different types of optimization, and so. Um, these are things you've become almost expert in just as time has gone along? Or is it already integrated when you start taking these, um, studying this field? Um, it, little by little. It had mm -hmm. to do with um, how the stochastic optimization problems in mathematical finance, in investments, uh, evolve with time. And I was very fortunate to, to be there from the very beginning. Yeah. Okay. So little by little. Yeah. And then can you, um, do you collaborate a lot with, with companies and firms that do investment? Are you able, you, you do connect yes. with- I talk, I talk I, yeah, I talk with practitioners and um, um, I should say that um, extremely interesting research is being done in the industry, quantitative research. So that's something that is very valuable for our field. Like you cannot just build models without, um, touching bases with what is being done out there. Right, with that, uh, with that inter without that interaction. Yeah. And then um, I wanna remind everybody, I'm just gonna take this time to remind everyone that we have a SIAM conference in financial mathematics and engineering coming up and that's June 1st through 4th. Yeah. Um, it's scheduled to be in Philadelphia, but it may be coming to you straight from your home office, living room, bedroom, um, wherever you may be. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but just remember that's in June. Okay. So let's see, let's see if there are any lingering questions. Uh, there, there is a, um, a question. How do companies that use robot advisors actually handle these issues now? Well, with a um, couple companies I have been um, communicating, um, um, it's still, they are trying to, um, first of all, it's very difficult within a, within a company to change the infrastructure that exists. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of, um, there, is, there are talks, there are discussions with researchers. And um, as you saw through my, my, my talk, there are so many different pieces that have to be put together mm -hmm. that um, progress is very slow. Yeah. Okay. Right. Good. Thank you. Well, thank you for a wonderful talk. This was fantastic. So thank you very much. All right. Bye. All right. Adios. Bye-bye.